But um, you wanted me to say? The name is Bond. The name is Bond. The name's Bond. Ruskin Bond. <laughs> <laughs>
So you, you were popular with the students? And yeah, I was, because I, I, I used to break the rules myself. Do you have a tuck shop or a canteen yes. or something? Yes, Chipu's. Chipu's. Hmm? Chipu's. Now it's called Chipu's. He, he was called Chipu in my time. So it's the same. Huh? Now it's the, the shop is enough. That's right. They still call it Chipu's. Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, right, that was my favorite place. <laughs> it's yeah. ours too. I'd be first outside the tuck shop waiting for it to open. Huh? And then <laughs> Yeah, so we gave, and of course, when we were allowed out to town, the first stop would be quality for ice creams mm, or milkshakes, and then a picture. We there were the, the, there were four cinemas: the Regal, the Ritz, and the Rivoli. So we could go to the pictures, you know, go to go eat in different places or. I'd, st I'd stop at a bookshop and I couldn't afford books, but I bought comics. I used to read comics. In those days, everybody read comics. Actually, <laughs> boys who didn't read books read comics. Uh, but, you you know, they, it, nowadays people say that children or young people don't read anymore. But they never did read. <laughs> even, even, even when I was at school, there were... There were just two or three of us who actually used the library seriously. Hmm? Everyone had to take a book out and yes, put it back possible. unread at the end of the week. Uh, so, but everybody else read comics, you know. Uh, but so you, and in those days, there were none of the distractions that we blame today for kids not reading because there was no television, no there were no phones. Uh, laptops or apps or phones. Uh, all the only entertainment was you could go to the pictures, that's when, on a holiday, <clears throat> or you could read. But even then, boys didn't read books. Very few did. Everyone read comics with them. And uh, so, reading has always been, I would, a minority pastime. It, 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 it still is. But today, because of the spread of education. Because there are so many schools and uh, where English is taught. So in terms of numbers, even if two boys out of 50 read books, hmm, in terms of actual numbers across the country, that's hundreds of thousands hmm, of readers. So whereas when I started writing, God knows how many years back, uh, 50, 60 years back, um, it was very hard to get readers or to sell my books and now today yes. um, they sell well they sell yes, very they well sell they've well. written over a hundred titles and uh, so so the readership is is there uh, though it's a minority hmm? um, it, uh, um, so do you, you must be having a, a, a good library now, fairly yes, big one. Yes, hmm? yes. yes we, it, it, we had a decent library, but it didn't have everything. It was <coughs> it was rather haphazard. So it consisted of books that were given to <laughs> us then, or given to the library. But I was lucky because they, since I was a bookworm, they put me in charge of the library. So I had the keys to the library. <laughs> So whenever I wanted to get away, escape morning PT or homework or things I didn't like, I'd slip off to the library and I had the keys and I'd lock myself in and read or maybe just sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had, it was an escape route for me. Um, you need an escape route in school sometimes because they keep you so busy. Hmm? <laughs> you, you, you can't always do the things yes. you want to do. Oh, it started in school actually, but as soon as I left school, I wrote a. I started writing, uh, sending stories to different magazines. Most of them came back, <coughs> uh, but then I had one. My first story accepted in nine, August '51. That's a few months after leaving school. It was accepted by a big magazine called the Illustrated Weekly of India, which was the top magazine then, and it was a sketch. Uh, it was a s fictitious sketch about a, a school teacher, a funny one. 
they didn't like it up in school actually so uh, like when you were my age uh, what were your favorite books at that time what's your age 11 11 oh good yeah i was just discovering books then really in a way i I'd, i'd been a reader bef- before that but around when i was 10 11 um i'd really got into books i remember taking david copperfield out of the um library school library and reading it right from beginning to end um, unabridged and that made me want to got me interested in writing because david grows up and becomes a writer and as a boy too he he ran away from home uh, so i did the same thing i ran away from home for a few days uh, ran out of pocket money so i had to come back <laughs> <laughs> If you run away from home, take enough pocket money with you to last last you out some time. <laughs> um, so there was David Copperfield. Yes, I identified with young David, mm. and and then of course I used the library a good deal. And but and then when I came home, just uh, shortly after my father died, when I was ten, and I came to <coughs> Dehradun where my mother and little stepfather lived. One day they took me along, and we st- stayed in this forest rest house in the jungles near Dehradun. <clears throat> and they all went out every day on elephants, so t- with their guns. They didn't shoot anything because nobody was a very good, uh, good shot <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But anyway, I was left behind usually in this dark bungalow, <clears throat> and I discovered there a, a, a shelf of books, you know, uh, of old books lying there, dusty and un, un. unused uh, and i started reading and there i read all sorts of authors love among the chickens by p g wodehouse so i got introduced to the humorous writings of p g wodehouse and one to buckle my shoe by agatha christie so then i got interested in detective stories and mysteries then i read a book the ghost stories of an antiquary by m r james which was got me interested in ghost stories and later i started writing ghost stories too there's one he lives up here actually uh-huh. uh in the attic only comes <laughs> down occasionally <laughs> so 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 th- i got introduced to different authors and different genres or different kinds of writing um and i still enjoy those writers but i read a lot i read even today uh three or four books a week mm. probably just for pleasure mm. uh and if there's nothing else to read i'll read the oxford dictionary mm. <laughs> because you can always learn up new words mm. and um the history and the the, the 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 history of words like you wrote so many books which is your personal favorite book the one i like most it's hot you know when you're writing a story or a book and if you're enjoying it <clears throat> then at that moment that particular book is your favorite <clears throat> maybe later on you look back and there'll be several then then that you like most well i my first novel i took a lot of trouble over i had to write it bef- at least two or three times <clears throat> uh, before i could get it accepted by a publisher, you know, publisher uh, when i was in england and um, So I worked hard on it <coughs> and also it was I was only 18 or so at the time and um so it it's it's in some ways immature but I have never changed it or tried to improve it because I it reflects me as I was then you know it's it's a novel about adolescence by an adolescent huh? so <coughs> it sh- it should remain as it is so even where maybe i could make improvements or changes i've not touched it ever since it was published hmm? like so what's your fa- your favorite book not written by you is in the books you like to read oh books that i like reading oh gosh again <laughs> that hundreds of books that uh, mm. like your favorite oh, genre, <coughs> authors genre. that i like let's say <clears throat> i like joseph conrad particularly his shorter works his tales of the sea typhoon and the nigger of the narcissus the shadow line uh, <coughs> youth and others we did youth in fact 
when I did Junior Cambridge. We had Junior Cambridge <coughs> in those days too, class 8. <laughs> um, so Conrad, I like and still read. Then, of course, I read all the works of Dickens. But now I, I find it difficult reading Dickens. Um, log descriptive passages that uh, 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 sometimes, I don't know, I was perhaps a more patient reader when I was a boy than I am now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, then I liked Somerset Mom, his short stories were good, and uh, other short story writers like Maupassant, the, the French writer, and O. Henry, the American writer, and H. E. Bates was an English short story writer. Um, so then I mostly I've written short stories more than mm, other kinds of things. Um, and games were given more importance than studies in those days. Um, I don't think that would be the case now. I'm sure it's studies opposite. come it's first. Opposite. Eh? It's, hmm? it's the opposite. Hmm? It's yes, but uh, you, you, if you were good in games, you were um, the school hero. Hmm? Yes, uh, if you were good at studies, well, okay. okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> that didn't matter. Huh? That didn't matter. That yeah, didn't matter much. Um, so well, we had two, two very. We, our our class, we did what was called the senior Cambridge. Hmm? It's senior more Cambridge. or less the like class ten or eleven, I suppose. <coughs> and uh, the year I did it, there were just twelve or thirteen of us, and not a very bright lot. That there were two very. Um, two very bright students. They were German boys, Kasper mm, and Andreas Kirchner, and they they had um, they had been in prison during the war. They they had been in prison camps first in Indonesia and then in India uh, because of, they were German. After the war, they came to Bishop Cotton, and they were uh, very good in science, maths. So they won all the prizes, and I might have been win, winning essay prizes and, and literature prizes, but they won all the science and maths prizes. Kaspar Kirchner, <coughs> he became a, um, a, a very well-known biologist uh, and a lecturer at Baal University later, uh, and his younger brother became a nuclear scientist in was in Canada. But you remember Jal Boga. Yes, very much. Charles Boga was was a friend, I remember. Yes, yes I think the year after high school, he he was junior to me by a year or two, a couple of years. So he must have uh, uh, come up into prominence the, the following year. <coughs> he was a very nice boy. Um, I think he was Parsi. And I used to hear of him after leaving school for some years, but I don't know where he went. I think he left the country. But he was a he was a, a good student and uh, and a very nice boy, a very pleasant boy. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hawks, yes. Mr. Hawks, yeah, he was a very big muscular man. <laughs> He'd been the army boxing champion, mm, and when he was younger, and he, he'd come from Sanawa. I think he'd also grown up in Sanawa, and he came as a PT PTI and. Um, um, he used to make his muscles dance. He <laughs> had great muscles, huh? <laughs> and uh, he, he would, uh, when especially when we small boys, when we were school, we would <laughs> ask him to show us his, make his <laughs> muscles dance, and he'd make this <laughs> pop around. Uh, and uh, they got him from Sanaa to to improve. The, the boxing standards in VCS, yes, yes. Um, which he did to some extent, uh, because then we we did beat Sanar in boxing. There was inter school boxing. Inter school there. boxing also. No, yeah, inter school boxing. Yes, against Sanar and uh, every year. Now it's so they would combine. We would go to, say to Sanar for boxing and combine it with hockey or football, depending on the time of year. And s cricket too, they would send their team okay, over. Yes, so that would be a two-day event usually. Yes. Um, so now suffered a lot uh, after independence <laughs> because all the 
British boys left. They were all British soldiers' children. And they were down to about just 50, 60 boys in the end. You know. And then it became a public school, or a, as it is today. It changed. It was no longer an army school. It became a public Public school. school. And then it picked up again. Mm -hmm. But it it went through a bad time when I was at school. So it was easy to beat them, uh, I have to say, because they didn't have many boys. (laughs) Is your main rival still Sanawa at (laughs) games? Of course. Hmm? Yes. Yes. We used to enjoy going to Sanawa, no? For if it was for a hockey or football, because we'd spend two or three days there, and they would combine, say, the, the, the football matches with the boxing or the other events. <coughs> in fact, my father had studied in Sanaa, because he, he was an army, uh, an army boy, um, and he did his schooling there. Uh, but he put me in Bishop Cotton. Um, he didn't want me to go to an army school, I think. <laughs> Which is the best place you like in the school, at your time? The best place in school? Yes, sir. After the tuck shop? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the library, a, I guess. A quiet place to sit. Oh, there was a bench right at the, on the upper flat. Yes, sir. Right in the corner, you know. Towards uh, Headmaster's Lodge. Yes, yes. There Not the Headmaster's House, the other side. Other side. Uh, there was a bench, it was a quiet spot. We would... I would sometimes sit there in the evening or with one or two other boys and we'd chat and, you know, uh, when nothing else was happening in school, which was rare because it <laughs> kept you pretty busy. Hmm? <laughs> so if you were in trouble, if you you committed some misdemeanor, you were summoned to your housemaster's or headmaster's office and you had to bend over and he had a nice malacca cane, you know, swish. It stung, and so you, you. The punishment varied from two to six. <laughs> they weren't allowed to, you, you know, weren't allowed, The teacher wasn't allowed to give you more than six strokes of the cane. Hmm? So, according to the misdemeanor, uh, the punishment varied. But the smart ones amongst us would sort of tuck books, books down the well, backs of our trousers or mm-hmm. something to. Mm-hmm. So that we wouldn't hurt too much, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I being a, I, I did that too the, on one occasion. And uh, Mr. I think it was Mr. Fisher here. The headmaster said, "Bend over, bond, so bend over, whack." <laughs> he said, "You got something there? Out with it!" Out I took, as you like it, by William Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Bend over again, Bond. You get another another strokes. Whack! There's still something there. Out! <laughs> I had to bring Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the titles I made up, but there, there was something or the other. <laughs> we used to. Uh, I'll tell you where the tunnel was. Um, I changed it a bit in the story, but there was when you, you know, there's a road going down to the. Uh, from the upper flat down to the main playground. Yes, Hmm? Hmm? And down that road, uh, uh, or coming up it, there was a a gap in the hillside where actually they had, I think, had planned to place some pipeline, or big pipeline. But it hadn't, they hadn't actually put it there. So there was this sort of um, very narrow uh, tunnel Going up from the, the that the road up to the first flat, so we would not everybody, but just some of us, we would crawl up it, hmm? uh, and t- till we got to the top and crawl out again. If had it collapsed, we'd have been finished, <coughs> but fortunately, it didn't. I think in the story I made it leading out of the school gate. Hmm? Hmm? No, but it was actually on that uh, road coming up from from where you have the I, in those days you had the, the the lavatories down there the school ghost we didn't really it, there was there was supposedly a school ghost but we never saw him <laughs> I, the, it was supposed to be the ghost of a, a boy who 
uh, when school on opening day of school, uh, he was present there hmm, and in attendance and gave attendance and everything. And then a day later, we he wasn't there and we heard he'd actually been uh, he died on the train journey coming to. Um, he'd, he'd stuck his head out of a window or something and been decapitated by a, a passing. Hmm? A passing train or something, yes. Uh, but he nevertheless came and gave his attendance in school hmm? <laughs> with his head on. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and sir, about the time you were in the infirmary with a teacher who was dead hmm? and her teeth popped out, what happened there? Which teacher? The so there's a story about you with the matron's body hmm. in the in the infirmary where, because you were there the most. Hmm. You and your friend were in charge of the body and apparently she coughed hmm. out of false teeth. Yes. So was that, oh, yeah. did that actually happen? Yes, it did happen That's actually. Sure. Mm, that did happen. It's, it's, it was in Missouri many years back when I lived in a, in a, another cottage further down the hill um, near the forest. And this very old lady lived there, uh, Miss Bean. And um, she was well into her 80s. She passed away one night. And uh, uh, we were, I and a friend was there. We took turns. We decided to, to sit near, near her, near the, near the dead body. So, and it, it was about midnight, one o'clock, and the moon was, moonlight was coming through the window, uh, over her, passing over her, and as as the moon shone on her face. She started smiling. Now she'd been dead for hours, you know, and she started smiling. And I got the fright of my life. I said, my goodness, she's alive. She'll come alive. And then suddenly, pop, her false teeth flew out. You <laughs> see, she rig rigor mortis had set in, you know, as the body stiffens. Yes, yes. And tightening of the jaws, and her teeth hadn't been removed. So with rigor mortis and the tightening, the teeth were forced out and shot out. And I shot out of the room. <laughs> yelling, <laughs> I, got, I got the fright of my life. <laughs> it did happen. Oh, face in the dark. Yeah, that's an old one. Well, not a very old story, but it's been in the... Yes, a treasure to mine. In the course. I thought you said... Um, so, we are both in different both, classes. Both we different classes, okay. Broke the bank, they are facing the dark. No, that's in another class, facing the dark. Oh. So, did you really experience that? Oh, yeah, that's that's set in, uh, that's, that's a Bishop Cotton Boy, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Huh? So, actually, you... Who had no face. Mr. Yes. Oliver. Mr. Flat Oliver. Oliver. Who was Flat the teacher there? We had a Mr. Oliver. Yes. But in junior school, in okay. prep school. Okay. And, uh, yes, and uh, he encounters the boy who has no eyes, no nose, no, no face. face. And then he, he rushes into the school, <coughs> school field and the Chokidar yeah, has no, no, no eyes, no face. Yes. And I must continue it. After that, Mr. Oliver rushes into his own room and looks into the mirror to see if yeah, what no. his face is like. <laughs> and there's nothing there. <laughs> his face has vanished altogether. <laughs> So I must give it one more ending, hmm? one more twist. Any questions? Okay, so the, somebody said, "What does it have any meaning?" That story. Oh, yes. So it, in a sense, it does. In that, for this teacher, Mr. Oliver, who year after year was seeing boys come and go, in the end, they had become faceless for him. You know, in a way. Hmm? So, uh, but so, so I, what then? Symbolize it in this. We had never thought about story. it. Yes, we never took it from that perspective. That perspective, sir. Mm -hmm. We thought it's. Like you just have to see a ghost story from a chalky yes, man who has no face. No face. <laughs> oh, I had to change trains. Uh, in fact, <laughs> when I was only, in, I think, twelve or so, my was put on the train. I had to change at Ambala, hmm? and I missed the connection at Ambala, and I was bit lost. I was 11 or 12. And that later on became a story of mine called The Woman on Platform 8. Mm -hmm. How a, a kind lady, a stranger, you know, took charge of me and uh, look, put me, looked after me, put me on the train. I never saw her again. <laughs> uh, so I wrote a story about it. 
It's called The Woman on Platform 8. One of my early stories. 19, well, the 1940s were actually a, a lot was happening then. Um, 1942, there was a Quit India movement in yes. India, so there was throughout the country a good deal of upheaval. Then World War II was going on. Huh? We were already in the second or third year of the Second World War. My father was serving in the RAF, and um, then along came independence, 1947, followed by partition, and then Gandhiji's assassination. So a lot was happening. So it was a period when a lot was happening in India and the world, in fact. But but when you're in, in school and in boarding school, you, you're not really touched by these things, uh, except that we were, uh, 1947, um, August after independence, when the disturbances broke out all over northern India due to Punjab being divided into <coughs> West Punjab, East Punjab, and uh, Bangladesh, and uh, Bengal being coming Bangladesh. Uh, so there was a, a lot of trouble everywhere, including Simla. And um, so, and all our, the, about one third of the school strength uh, were boys who came from uh, places like Lahore and Rawalpindi, which became then part of Pakistan. And because of all the trouble, they had to be evacuated, in, uh, in fact, overnight. Uh, the school was under a good deal of threat. The senior boys were armed, were given rifles. Fortunately, they didn't have to use them. <laughs> um, but uh, so the, at midnight, these army trucks came, and the boys were tumbled into them, and they were driven. And fortunately, they got over the border safely. Although I believe two or three domestic servants lost their lives because they went wandering off into the bazaars in. Kalka, down in Kalka. Uh, well, so that left a great depletion in the strength of the school. I think it was a hard time, maybe, f for Bishop Cottons to get over that period. Hmm? Uh, but within a year or two, uh, we were back to full strength. Then a lot of boys came in from, uh, from Patiala and the Patiala state and the other neighboring states. Uh, so the, the number of Sikh boys increased tremendously uh, in 48, 49. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so, well, it was a, un a unique period, you could say. Mm. And uh, I was at BCS from 1943 to 1950, eight years. Huh? Okay. Um, from, we had a prep school then. There was to be a preparatory school. It was situated, I think it's, there's a, isn't there a Tibetan school in Chota Simla? Well, those buildings were the Bishop Cotton's preparatory school. Um, and the prep school got merged with the senior school as a result of partition and as a result of a lot of disturbances in Chota Simla at that time. Hmm? So all the s small boys had to be evacuated and brought to the senior school. Hmm? And uh, so there was, a good deal of confusion <laughs> um, uh, as far as, you know, uh, space went. Yeah. So during the Quit India Movement or the Freedom Movement in 1947, well, like, was there animosity between the children? No, not at all. Not at all. B between the, the children there was no animosity at all, no. Uh, we were, I don't know, when they went home it might have been different, but in school itself there was no animosity. <coughs> we were very those who remained be behind were very sorry to uh, to say goodbye to those who left because there were a lot of fr friends made. Hmm. Um, in fact, I kept up correspondence with one or two for some years. Met them again in London when I went there after school. Um, the year after I finished school, <coughs> my mother sent me off to England. I did a year in the Channel Islands and um, then two, two years in London, writing my first book. So I, <coughs> well, I'll tell you what I owe to Bishop Cotton, yeah. 
uh, my interest in writing and books. <clears throat> in those days, it wasn't fashionable to want to be a writer or to want to be a writer. There were no other boys in the school who were interested in writing. In writing. Today, I meet young young youngsters all the time who want to write, who are writing, who even published <laughs> published their books. <clears throat> but it wasn't the case then. <clears throat> Writers were known more by their names, and not by their faces, huh? because we didn't have the visual media. Yes. You know, there was no television or, or cameras or photos or or, or, the, or the you know visual media that you have today. So you didn't become a celebrity in the sense of as a cricketer does or a film star does. Um, and today, even writers become known sometimes um, by their faces or their figures. <laughs> and so there was, uh, so it wasn't something everyone, you know, thought of doing. So I was, in a way, an exception. Um, but certainly, we um, had one or two teachers who, <coughs> who were literary or encouraged me to write. Mr. Jones was one, there was Whitmarsh Knight, another. Courtesy, being polite. It's a great weapon, courtesy. You can get a lot done in life simply by being nice to people, by being courteous, by being polite. You know, it disarms people too. So you learn politeness, courtesy, to behave in a civilized way. You avoid the crudities of maybe, of, of much of everyday life. You learn fellowship, yeah, uh, you can make bonds of friendship uh, which last. Um, so so there's, a good, there's a lot to be said uh, for uh, life in a particularly boarding school, hmm? a, a good one. <coughs> and uh, otherwise I wouldn't be reminiscing or hmm, talking to you. <laughs> well, I'll say this, I think when you, um, while you're at school, you don't always <clears throat> maybe realize the value that you're getting in your education, and it's only later on in life that you will perhaps can appreciate it more, and um, I owe a lot certainly to my school and uh, to those times at school, and you will too. Um, <coughs> and. Um, it's, it's, it's I, I would always say by the time you leave school, it's, it's a good thing if you already have in your mind an, an idea of what you want to do in yes, life. Yes. Um, because then you, you won't have this problem of later on deciding should I become this or that or, yeah. you know, have a clear, clear idea of the kind of career you want to pursue, pursue. Uh, and the, the life you want to lead. And I think it's good if you can have that in your mind bef before you finish school. Hmm? Um, and uh, it's, you know, when I went, you learn little things sometimes which come in use later. When I went to England after leaving school and I went to Jersey and I, I, I got a job there in the health department. And um, when I went for it, interview along with a lot of other young men there and I was selected simply because whenever the the director of that department asked me a question um, I would answer it and it and in answering it I would call him sir which nobody else did and he asked me Why do you by the way, he said, which school did you go to? He presumed I'd gone to a school in England. Mm. Mm. I said I went to school in India, yes. and he was, uh, he was surprised. Uh, because over there, and in many schools, you don't, they don't bother to say sir to the teacher. Mm. They'll call him Mr. So-and-so or anything that. Huh? So, but only in a public school in England, yeah, the traditional public school, you would still say yes. sir. Mm. So he presumed I was from an, an English public school. And so, so these little things, what I was saying, courtesy, um, the way you talk uh, to people is very important. Hmm? 
And uh, that's something you learned also in, in a school like BCS um, without realizing it at the time. Hmm? Um, you get some polish, let's say. Hmm? Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good. We, we use, very helpful it will be. And that, son? That's, that's, gift. Another, one. What that's, that's, that's another gift. Hmm? Heavy. Why don't you unwrap together? Wait a minute, it's heavy. You'll have to unwrap it for me. Yes, yeah. 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 mm. mm. Oh, it's a bad, wonderful. Good. I've got a. It's coasters. It's coasters. It's blue coat, I'll put it on that. It, uh, it is. Turn it on. So, the scoop. The scoop. Oh, wonderful. Is it a model of the. Yes, yes. Model? yes. Yeah. little model. Of the school building? Yes, yes. Main school, main school yeah. building. Great. And do you know where my bed was? Yes, I sir. Exactly, exactly here. You know where you now got this. Um, above yeah, the entrance. Common room. Up it's there. If it's now's common room now. Yeah, it was a dormitory. Posh, dormitory. It was a bit of a dormitory. Posh, dormitory. Posh, posh, and there was a window there in my yeah. time, a big bay window. And I Sides. had my bed near the window. Oh. So from there, I could drop things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, mouse bag. Hmm? Mouse bag. Okay. Yeah.